So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Romans chapter 12 this morning. Keith's reading in Ephesians was a prayer for the church, and in that prayer he talked about understanding and knowing and comprehending the love of Christ and what it is. Well, here in Romans chapter 12, as we continue our way through this chapter, Paul encourages us to love as well. Romans chapter 12, and it's verses 9 and 10. Before we go any further, let's just pause for a moment and ask God's blessing on our thoughts this morning. Our Lord, we do indeed give you thanks today for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for uh, a love that led him to come to this earth, to live amongst us, to take on flesh and blood and to be like us, or to suffer as we suffer. And then ultimately that he might give his life on the cross as a sacrifice for our sin. Lord, we owe everything to you. And we ask, Lord, that this morning as we look into your word, we'll be conscious of your presence here, of your voice speaking to our hearts. May we let your spirit have his way in our lives today, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we're going to be looking at just two verses. They're short verses. At first glance, they seem relatively straightforward. We read through them, we we nod our heads and we say, yes, uh, that's right, I agree with that. And then we move right on to the next thing without giving those verses another thought. Well, these verses may be short, but there's a world of wisdom here for us if we would take time to consider it. Much of what I have to say this morning, you'll have heard me say before, and you'll likely hear me say again. Uh, But don't let that minimize in any way what's being said here in the scriptures. Some truths are so important that we ought to be reminded of them constantly. If you can get these few simple commands into your mind and heart, if you can understand what they should mean to you in your life and learn to live by them, then you'll have gained more wisdom for yourself than most of this world's philosophers gain in a lifetime. So let's read these two verses. Let's see what God has to say to us. Verses 9 and 10, Romans chapter 12. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. I need to start by clarifying just exactly what the Bible means by love. We've talked about this before, and uh, but, uh, just to be clear, you know, of course, the New Testament was originally written in ancient Greek. And the Greeks had at least three different words that they would use, which are often translated love. There's eros, or physical love. That shouldn't need any further explanation. And then there's uh, a second word, philia, which is friendship or affectionate regard for another. It's a love that would exist between family members or friends. It was a virtuous love, the kind of love that would inspire loyalty. But the Bible speaks of a third kind of love. It's the highest form of love there is. We find an example of that word used right here in our text today, where it says, let love be without dissimulation, or let love be without hypocrisy. Let love be genuine, let it be sincere. The original word used here for love is the word agape. Before the New Testament was written, the ancient Greeks hardly ever used this word. When they did, it meant something along the lines of holding someone in high regard or having high esteem for someone. Maybe, for example, and it was used like this, as uh, your regard for your commanding officer if you were in the army. But when it came to describing the love of God, none of these words properly expressed the extent and the depth of his love. So the writers of the New Testament took this word agape and they gave it a new meaning. The meaning that it still has today. What most people don't realize when they speak about true love is that they're actually using a concept of love that was first defined in the Bible. Before the New Testament was written, 
the highest ideal of love was not properly stood, understood anywhere. The Old Testament used a, a word, it's a wonderful word, to describe the love of God. It's a Hebrew word, the word chesed, which is often translated mercy or loving kindness or steadfast love. But even then, it still took the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to help us understand more fully what was meant by the love of God. <clears throat> Jesus is the living expression of God, <coughs> who is love eternal. And of course the ultimate expression of that love was seen in his willingness to die. Not for himself, but on our behalf, as a sacrifice for our sins. As the scripture says, in this was the love of God manifested, that he sent his only begotten son into the world, that the world might live through him. See, the gospel isn't a message about death, it's a message about life. God is here to give us life. As Jesus said, I'm here to give you life and to give it more abundantly. Apostle John goes on to say in 1 John 4, here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the, the sacrifice for our sins. Earlier in his letter to the Romans, the, one, the passage that we're in this morning, the Apostle Paul acknowledges that most people would not be willing to die for someone else. Although someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God commended his love toward us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends, and you are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. I have given you an example that you should do unto one another, as I have done unto you. Happy are you if you know these things, and do them. So you see, it's in Jesus himself that the love of God is most fully revealed, most fully expressed, most fully realized. The classic biblical definition of divine love we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Don't necessarily need to turn there this morning. I'm going to read it, if you'll permit me, uh, using the SBV version. That's the Stephen Bender version. <laughs> love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It does not insist on having its own way. It is not easily angered. It holds no grudges. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love <coughs> never fails. This concept of love is unique to Christianity. No other religion speaks of love in this way. The gods of the ancient world, for example, the gods of the Greeks or the Romans or the Vikings, you know, these gods are portrayed often as powerful, <coughs> superhuman-like beings. They might reward the good and punish the evil. At times they can even be merciful and forgive the erring one for his or her mistakes. But these false gods knew nothing of the divine love that we find in the scripture. <coughs> in fact, the ancient myths often portray them as quite promiscuous, always falling in and out of relationships. They were not above using deceit or trickery to have their way with another. And even on occasion, they might be guilty of raping the innocent or the unsuspecting. No, it's Christianity that gave to the world the high and virtuous concept of true love that we have today. Is it any wonder then that uh, as Western society turns its back on Christianity, that we also see a growing perversion of the divine ideal of love? Jesus warned us that when iniquity shall increase, the love of many shall wax cold. The Bible tells us that in the last days, people will be lovers of their own selves, without natural affection. Indeed, they will be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. As Christians, we're not to follow the example of this world. We have a higher example to follow. 
Paul says back in verse 2 of the same chapter, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. As Christians, we should be setting the example. So here in verse 9, we are commanded to love. And who are to be the objects of our love? Well, firstly, I suppose it goes without saying that uh, God should be the prime object of our love. You know what Jesus said when he was asked what the great, greatest commandment was. He said to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. For that is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two hang all the law and the prophets. There should be nothing of any higher value in your life than the Lord himself. Nothing should compete with him. If you're faced with a choice of whether to put God first in something or something else, well, really, there's no choice. God should always be first in your thoughts and in your doings. Every time. Anything else that could potentially take the place of God in your life will be of lesser value. This is not to say that family, husbands, wives, or children are not. Of course they are. But we love our families best when that love is a result of, or a consequence, or an outflow of the love of God in us. You love your family best when you love God first. Okay then. So God is to be the prime object of our love, of our affection. But as Jesus pointed out, our love for others is no less important. Our love for others indeed is a reflection of the way we love God. If our love for God is shallow and changeable, hot one moment and cold the next, then our love for others may also be much the same, shallow and changeable. When that's the case, relationships suffer. Relationships are built on trust and faithfulness. But when your love is on one moment and off the next, there's no basis for building a deep, solid, and meaningful relationship. Similarly, the way you love others is a measure of how much you love God. The Apostle John makes this very point in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. He asks the question, if someone says, I love God, and yet hates his brother, he's a liar. If he can't love people who he can see, how can he love God who he has not seen? John goes on to say that one of the key signs that you're born again, that you belong to the family of God, is that you love the other members of God's family. <coughs> you enjoy being together with other believers. You look forward to sharing worship together with them, studying God's word together, praying together. You care for them and you desire God's best for them and, and they for you. You want to be of service. You want to help in any way you can. To love and encourage one another in the Lord, especially in these times when so, so few of the people that we mix with in a week have any care or thought for the things of God. I mean, that's the point made in Hebrews, isn't it? Not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together as a matter of some is, but exhorting, that's encouraging, comforting one another, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. So as I've said before, and I'll say it again, life is not all about you. So much of finding meaning and fulfillment <coughs> in life comes as we share our time and our love with others. We're not meant to go through life on our own, hiding away. Sure, it takes effort. Sure, it's not easy or always convenient. But for your own sake, at the very least, for your own health and well-being, you need to get out and fellowship with others, particularly with other believers. Others are counting on you, and when you're not there, everyone suffers, and most of all, you. So we need to love God, and we need to love others. But it also needs to be said that you must love it yourself. 
I mean, after all, isn't that what Jesus said? To love your neighbor as yourself. I don't know whether you've noticed, but there's a lot of dissatisfaction and unhappiness in our society today. So many people who are not happy with themselves, <coughs> so unhappy, in fact, that they willingly abuse themselves and their bodies in a number of ways. If you find yourself in such a condition, realize this is not what God intended for you. He made you for a purpose. And you'll only find true joy and fulfillment in your life as you discover God's will for you. <coughs> to accept it willingly and to embrace it wholeheartedly. God makes no mistakes. And he didn't make a mistake when he made you. So learn to love yourself <coughs> the way God made you. And as you discover yourself in Christ, you'll find you have something special to bring to this world which no one else can. So take care of yourself and don't let anyone or anything else steal away your joy in the Lord. You may not always be able to do for others as you'd like, but if you don't take care of yourself and your own needs, spiritual otherwise, then you'll be less able to be a help to others when they might need you. Some Christians pride themselves in self-denial as if the only true spiritual people are those who deny themselves any and all joy and laughter. You can see them coming a mile away, dark, sour characters who manage successfully to suck all the light and joy out of a day. But that's not what I see when I read God's Word. The Bible is full of promises concerning joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. God takes delight in your happiness. Every command he's given in his word is designed to promote your well-being. Jeremiah 29 verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, said the Lord. Plans of peace, well-being, and not of evil, to give you a hope for the future. Fear not, Jesus says, my little flock, for it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. James 1.17. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights with whom it's no verbis, no shadow of turning. Psalm 37 verse 4, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. 1 John 5 3, This is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. His commandments are not grievous. Jesus is my burden. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. What is our love to be like? How are we to do this? Well, the text tells us here that we're to love without dissimulation, that is to love without hypocrisy. We're not to be false. Love is not something you can pretend. Indeed, it's not something you should try to pretend. You should always seek to love from the heart. There is no other way to love someone than to love them from the heart. No one likes a hypocrite. <coughs> Hypocrisy bears the mark of the original sin. Hypocrisy is pretending to be something that you're not. It's a deception. It's a lie. It's about being false. Just like the serpent, when he deceived Eve, when he pretended to have her best interests at heart. Why would anyone want to be like that? Why would anyone want to be deceitful? And yet they are. Certainly not for the best of reasons. Very often it's for the worst of reasons. When you lie and deceive others, you do so for vain and selfish reasons. When you lie and deceive others, it's often because you want to hurt them in some way. And when you practice deceit, you not only hurt others, but you harm yourself. Worst of all, you dishonor God, who is the God of truth. And the Lord Jesus Christ, his Son, who is truth incarnate. Now, rather than to love falsely, we ought to love with sincerity. A heart that loves sincerely is a heart that's true and honest. A heart that best reflects the heart of God. Our love for others honors God, because in loving others, we love those who he created in his own image. 
Now I know by experience it's not always easy to love others. Some people can try your patience. Some people can get on your nerves. When you come across someone like that, you've got to ask yourself, what would Jesus do? How can I show the love of Jesus to this person and show it in a way that's sincere? At the very least, you ought never to be rude or unkind. You can speak the truth, but just make sure you do it in a way that is not mean or vindictive. You should never wish anyone harm. Find something in them that you can like and focus on that. In fact, the longer I think about it, I know exactly what Jesus would do, because he tells us in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Think about how you would like to be treated in the same situation, and then go about treating others the same way. So we looked at the first command in verse 9. Verse 9 says, to love, let your love be without dissimulation. Love without hypocrisy. Love sincerely. But now we come to the second command in the same verse. If you thought the first command was challenging enough, well, just wait till we look at this one. Abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. At first this can sound like two separate commands, but really they're just two sides <coughs> to the same coin. But let's break it down anyways and look at each aspect on its own. <coughs> Firstly, we're encouraged here to hate what is evil. First glance, you might wonder why the Apostle Paul even goes here. It doesn't really seem to fit in with what he's been talking about. In fact, the very next verse, he goes right back to talking about love and compassion again. So why did he sandwich this command right here in the middle of talking about love? Well, I think it might have to do with balance. Achieving or finding the right balance. Love is so important. Indeed, it's absolutely essential if we're going to understand anything about God and what it means to live the Christian life. But love by itself is not enough. It's not the whole picture. God knows us. He knows us only too well. After all, He made us. And He knows what we're like. He knows our tendency to go to extremes. And look at society. It's always veering from one extreme to the other. What's more... <coughs> He also knows that we like to keep things simple. We're quick to latch on to the simplest explanation for things. The simplest explanations aren't always the right ones. Most people don't like making the effort to think seriously about complex issues. Most people are content to try and get through life with simple one-liners <coughs> to help get them through. But the problem with that is that just life isn't always that simple. In the 1960s, the Beatles came out with a song, All You Need Is Love. The song was to be the UK's <laughs> contribution to the first ever live global television link. Lennon knew it was for an international audience, so he kept the lyrics deliberately simple. Simple words together with a simple, catchy tune, and you have the makings for an international hit. Just one problem with the song. Love is not all you need. The Apostle Paul has just emphasized the importance of love, of genuine, heartfelt love. And if love were the only guiding principle in life, it wouldn't be long before you'd be in a mess of things. If everyone in the world were pure and loving and kind-hearted all the time and genuinely always desired to do the right thing from the heart and were never selfish or covetous, then perhaps we could get along with just love. But the fact of the matter is there's evil in this world. And that evil resides within the heart of every one of us. If we don't come to terms with this, if we're not willing to face this uncomfortable truth about ourselves, if we don't confront it and deal with it head on, then we're asking for trouble. If love were our only guiding principle, then it wouldn't be long before things degenerated into a complete free-for-all. On the other hand, if all we had were righteousness, then there'd be no place for mercy or for forgiveness or for restoration or for healing. So there has to be this balance where nothing works as it should. And we see this perfect balance 
in the character of God Himself. God is love. That's true. And He's also holy. These are not counterbalancing weights that kind of operate against each other to keep things in perfect balance. No, God's not in conflict within Himself between two equal and opposing poles. God is love precisely because He is holy and perfect in every way. These attributes exist within Him in perfect harmony. Verse 9, the Apostle Paul has been encouraging Christians to emulate that same balance. To be motivated in love by love in all that we do, but at the same time seeking always to do what is right and good and best. In fact, I would go so far as to say that the one who is truly motivated by love will always want to do what is right and good and best. So here we're instructed to abhor that which is evil. That's a very strong statement. Paul isn't saying that we should just, you know, go tap in the hand and wiggle the finger, don't do that again. No, he says we have to abhor evil, to have a horror of it. To detest it and everything about it. Why? Because evil is so destructive. Sin always leads to harm. It always leads to ruin. Sin divides. It separates. It degrades and destroys. There's nothing good that can come of it. Just as you can't toy with fire and not get burned. Or play with a serpent without it biting back. So you can't trifle with sin without paying the consequences. If there is a rule in operation in our universe, it's this. That for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And that's just as true when it comes to spiritual issues as with anything else in our cosmos. Do wrong, and there will be consequences sooner or later. Only the fool thinks he can get away with it. The fool says, don't be such a killjoy. It won't happen like that to me. I know what I'm doing. Just one time can't hurt. I can stop whenever I want to, and so forth. Famous last words. You see, when it comes to evil, there's only really one proper response, and that's to abhor it. To have nothing to do with it. Don't even give it a moment of your time. Run in the opposite direction as fast as you can. But you know, it's never just enough to get rid of something in your life. When you get rid of something, you're left with an empty hole that needs filling. You know what they say, nature abhors a vacuum. It won't be long before something else rushes in to fill it, to fill that empty space in your life. So if you're going to take something away, then you need to replace it with something better. So as the Apostle Paul writes, Yes, abhor that which is evil, but he also encourages at the same time to cleave or to cling, to hold fast to that which is good. You know, most everyone I meet, they don't always set out intentionally to do wrong. At heart, I'd say most people, most of the time, generally want to do the right thing. The problem with us is that we don't stick to it. Our resolve weakens over time. For example, how many of you made a resolution or two this new year? Don't raise your hands. <laughs> now let me ask you this. How many of you stuck to your resolution? Again, don't raise your hands. I wonder how many new gym memberships go unused every year. Everyone starts off with great determination. This year I'm going to do it at last. I'm not going to let anything get in my way. I'm determined to lose a stone before the summer. Well, I've been trying to lose the same stone now for about 15 years. <laughs> you can see how well that's done. Anyway, you see my point. We can all start off with the best of intentions, right? But we can so easily lose direction. Other things come up, as they inevitably will. It's life, and they'll get in the way. And before we know it, we've forgotten all about the commitment we made. It's easy to think right thoughts for a little while. It's easy to do the right thing for a short season. It's easy to come up with resolutions for what we'd like to do, 
or change. But it's another thing entirely to stick to it for the long term, to follow through, to hold the course, especially when the going gets rough, as it will. I've seen it so many times. People recognize the need for God in their lives. And they start coming to church and they say things like, wow, this is amazing. This is exactly what my life needs. I come and I can feel the love and the joy. The Word of God never ceases to speak straight to my heart. It's like God's talking to me. This is what I need. And then other things start crowding into the lives. It's amazing how many things can only be done on a Sunday morning between 11 a.m. and 12 noon. Our resolve begins to weaken. It's so easy to slip back into old ways and before we know it, right back where we were before, if not worse. And so the scriptures encourages us, cling to that which is good. Hold on to it and don't let go. Hold on to it with all you might and don't let go for any reason. Do the right thing whether you feel like it or not. And don't let anything or anyone come between you and your commitment to live for Christ. Well, then we come to verse 10. And with this, Paul rounds out his thoughts. He returns to that command about love. Look at verse 10. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Christians should be known for their love. We should be a compassionate people, even as Jesus has had compassion on us. We should always show honor and respect to others. We should be compassionate and respectful day in and day out, rain or shine. People shouldn't have to walk on eggshells around us. They shouldn't have to tiptoe into the same room as us, worrying what mood we might be in. Over and over again in the scriptures, remind that God's not like that. God's not changeable. He doesn't have moods. He doesn't lose control. He doesn't react in a fit of anger. When God does something, he does it because he intends to do it. There's a purpose in everything that he does. God is not changeable. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. And that means also that God's word doesn't change. If he says he's going to do something, he will do it. God's not one to break his promise. He's faithful to keep his every word. And it's precisely because God is faithful that you and I can have hope. We can trust God to fulfill his promises. The most important decision you will ever make in your life is the decision to put your trust in Jesus. The best decision you'll ever make in life is the decision to trust in Him. He will not let you down. We can trust Him because He's ever the same. And as Christians, we need to be known for our faithfulness too. We're to be kindly affectioned one to another. Not just when we feel like it, but always. Because that's what we're commanded to do. Verse 10 adds to the command the words, in honor, preferring one another. It's an interesting turn of phrase. Paul says something similar in other places as well. In Philippians chapter 2, he talks about esteeming others better than yourself. It has to do with putting others or the interests of others before your own. The word preferring that he uses here in verse 10 is a very interesting word. Literally, it has to do with going before or leading onward. In other words, it talks about leading by example so that others can follow the idea of going first. So what this verse is kind of telling us is that as Christians, we shouldn't wait on others before doing the right thing. To use the catchphrase of the day, we're not to be reactive or to be intentional. Yeah? When it comes to showing respect for others, we should lead by example. We should reflect the character of Christ in all we do and say. Well, we've covered quite a lot of territory this morning. I've told you there was a lot in these two verses. And I've only just really scratched the surface about what could be said. 
It's been said that you are the only Bible that some people will ever see. That being the case, what would they learn? What would they come to understand about God, about Jesus? What would they learn about the message of the Bible from watching you and the way you live your life? Here the Apostle Paul lays down a few short life principles. Don't be a hypocrite. Be generally filled with compassion in your heart towards others. Have nothing, absolutely nothing to do with evil. Hold on to what is true and right and good and never let go. Never give up. Keep on doing what you know is right before God, even when you don't feel like it. And when it comes to showing respect for others, always lead by example. So in closing, might it be our prayer that our lives ever be an accurate reflection of the character of Christ, of his grace. May others see Jesus in me and in you. May our lives so shine out with the love of Christ and his truth that others can see it. They can see the likeness of Christ in us and God be glorified. And just a few thoughts then from these simple verses. Trust that something that God can use to be a helpful lesson to you in your life. As always, if you have any questions about anything that's said here, concerns about your soul, why you can come, we have to speak with you further. And uh, pray together, you can know that you, you leave this morning knowing all that is well between you and your God. Um, really? Come and lead us.